All right, welcome back to the channel. Today I want to talk just a little bit more about rifle cartridge design. I touched about it on the last video about the 30-06 when I mentioned the primitive era of cartridge design, moving into the classic era, and then the more modern era. And today I'm going to talk about kind of that classic and modern era and kind of give you some of the pioneers of cartridge design and what parent cases, you know, gave birth to so many different children. And um, I think it'll be pretty interesting for you. But, you know, before there was a cartridge, obviously it was a muzzle loader. All the components were loaded separately into the muzzle. And that goes back to the very first firearm. But once they started to load those cartridges, you know, they had black powder and they were generally tube fed from either a single shot or a lever action. Most of them were rimmed cartridges. That was the primitive time. But in 1886, there was a new cartridge that came out. And the thing that was the most special about this cartridge was the powder. And so that's what we're gonna get into today, talk about the beginning of that classic period of um, rifle cartridge design and then kind of how it leads toward modern cartridge design. So let's look at that now. One differentiating factor that we can talk about between classic cartridge design and modern cartridge design is really is the, opt the optics. So let me explain that. Way back when you had your 30-06 and you had your seven millimeter Mauser, and then you go into your 220 Swift and you start coming out with these with these magnums, like your seven rim mag and your 264 magnum. It was all about flat shooting, fast, flat shooting, because at the beginning of this period, there was no scopes or they were super, super primitive. But it wasn't until the last, I would say 20 to 30 years, we've really got into high quality, affordable scopes. So most people have just never even used a good scope or there was no such thing. And so to shoot at a thousand yards was a very niche thing. Um, it was more common just to go out and hopefully kill a deer and you wanted the flattest rifle cartridge possible. So you, it'd be easier to judge drop. And also if it's going super fast, there's a good chance the wind's not going to mess with it a whole lot. You were not concerned with thousand yard shots. Okay. Rel relatively close shots, flat shooting, and then, you know, um, you don't have to worry about a whole lot of drop as long as you know your maximum point blank range and you've practiced with it. And so you just keep getting weather bees that are bigger <laughs> and, you know, magnums and just keep putting more and more powder behind the bullet. And generally, smaller bullet, more powder, faster, which equates to flatter shooting. So you don't have to worry about it. Easier to shoot animals at longer range. But when the more modern cartridge design started to happen, scopes are better, optics are better. You can see clearly at longer ranges. You have, you know, range finders and you have reticles with bullet drop compensators and you have apps that do all these ballistic calculations for you. And so, then you start to realize it's not super, it's not the flattest, fastest shooting ground that's the most accurate at a thousand yards. Maybe we need to readjust our thinking. Maybe our bullet needs to be more ballistically coefficient. Maybe we need to slow it down just a little bit to be more consistent and accurate. And that's when modern cartridge design started to kick in. Anyway, just a little caveat there. Okay. So this might appear a bit overwhelming at the beginning. So let's just focus in on this cartridge right here. In 1886, the French came up with a cartridge called eight millimeter Lebel, which was the world's first smokeless cartridge round. So the powder being used was not black powder, but smokeless powder. This, in my opinion, begins the classic rifle cartridge era. Gone was the primitive black powder 
cartridges and this was a giant leap forward. And basically it took the world by storm and every cartridge manufacturer immediately started to manufacture smokeless powder and new cartridges, I should say, using the smokeless powder. One of those would be in Germany, the German government, military, came up with the eight millimeter. This was an eight by 57 case and it used that smokeless powder like we just talked about. But also to note was that this case is the first case with that was uh, rimless. It did not have a rim. So <clears throat> usually a rim on a cartridge like the LaBelle was pretty good for tubular fed magazines and lever action rifles, but not so good in bolt action rifles. And the Germans had an idea of a different way to, you know, hold the, the rounds and chamber the rounds. And they decided to go with that um, I, idea of a rimless case. And that was a big idea. So both of these cartridges you see right here are two of the pioneers of this new era. Also the eight millimeter that was created by Germany had a head diameter of 0.473, which would go on to spawn almost all of your medium bore rifle cartridges like 30-06, 308, so on and so forth. So in around 1891, 1891, three different countries started to produce three more cartridges. In Sweden, they came up with the 6.5 by 55. Also in Germany, uh, Peter Paul Mauser, for his own business, decided to kind of copy that eight millimeter um, by 57 round it was, that came out in 1988, and he decided to do kind of his own version of it, but neck it down to seven millimeter, and he came up with the seven millimeter Mauser. And then over in Russia, they came up with <clears throat> the 7.62 Russian, which was a rimmed case. Now, these three right here are three of the pioneers, once again, of everything you're about to see. But specifically, I would say, oops, sorry. Specifically, I would say the Mauser. So the Swede, I've got just kind of trailing off here because even to this day, it's still produced. Even to this day, not a whole lot, but there are some rifles chambered in it. 7.62 Russian, got it trailing off because it continues to this day too. Not super popular, but you know, the Mosin Nagant all the way through the World Wars, even to this day, is still around. So of those three produced in 1891, very popular. But I feel like the seven millimeter Mauser is the one I want to talk about the most because the majority of all this, our modern day cartridges, was based off of that which once again was based off of that. Now, quick side note, two cartridges, the 500 Nitro Express and the 450 Nitro Express, which were black, black powder cartridges, was revamped around 1898 for the smokeless powder. And that would have been, <clears throat> excuse me, that would have been two of the first African cartridges with the new smokeless powder. Um, and they used that 1898 Mauser, which same guy that created this cartridge came up with the 1898 Mauser. He had come up with many other Mausers before that in the 1870s and 80s and 90s. But the 1898 Mauser was pretty much the gold standard and would lead the path forward for all bolt action rifles for the next 100 years. Even to this day, it's kind of the base design of everything we have going today. And in 1898, they used kind of a Magnum version of that action to produce some heavy, um, dangerous game style African 
rounds. Having said that, a lot of people used the seven millimeter Mauser in Africa. And a lot of people would hunt moose and everything else with the 6.5 by 55 sweep. Now, just as a quick side note, in 1895, America, with actually Winchester more specifically, came up with the 3030 Winchester. And it came out in 1894, um, Winchester rifle. And jo John Browning was around producing rifles at that time as well and chambered the round. And John Browning, of course, worked for Winchester, but the 3030 Winchester was the first American-made cartridge using the smokeless powder. But it was, it was rimmed and it was more made for lever action rifles. But once again, it trails off here on my piece of paper because it continues to this day. Now, in the beginning of this new century, you had a couple really important rounds come out. Now, you might see here the eight millimeter Mauser in 1905. You might think, well, isn't this the same thing? It's technically a little different. So, in 1905, the German army, using the new 1898 Mauser bolt-action rifle, decided to kind of revamp the 8mm the eight millimeter from, from up here. And they kind of took the best of both worlds and kind of took this design, but yet some, you know, design aspects from Mauser's version came up with the 8mm Mauser. And that's the version that continues until this day. That's the version that was in their, you know, Model 98 Mausers in World War I and World War II. And around the same time, <clears throat> actually a few years before that, in the Spanish-American War, the Americans with their Springfield trapdoor rifles and 3040 Craig cartridges were walloped pretty good by that seven millimeter Mauser cartridge. And I believe at that time it would have been a 1893 Mauser. But anyway, they decided if you can't beat them, join them. And they came out with the Springfield rifle, which was, a, was the 1903 Springfield rifle, which was a copy basically of the Mauser 98. And they went with a 30-06 cartridge. It was a brand new cartridge, however, it kind of was a design from the 7mm Mauser. They lengthened it and they necked it up to 30 caliber. Okay. <clears throat> and then, of course, we know the 30 6 goes on to spawn the 270 in 1925, the 25 6 the 280 Remington, 35 Whalen. We know that the 7 and 8 millimeter spawn the 257 Roberts and the six millimeter Remington as well. I'm going to divert before we get to some of this stuff. I want to kind of do, oops, sorry, a little bit of a diversion over to African cartridges. So these two cartridges come down here and I want to talk about these four companies right here. In the early 1900s, there was four British companies. Seems like Britain was the main country that was that was building and supplying dangerous game rifles for Africa, probably because they had colonies over there. And four businesses, Wesley Richards, Jeffries, Rigby, and Holland and Holland was all kind of coming up with a new design. Of course, it was going to be smokeless powder. And they were trying to figure out a really good design, <clears throat> excuse me, for a new big game, dangerous game, African hunting rifle. In 1909, Wesley Richards came out with the 425 Wesley. In that same year, Jeffries came out with the 404 Jeffries. 1911, Rigby came out with the 416 Rigby. And in 1912, Holland and Holland came out with the 375 H and H or Holland and Holland. Now, this cartridge didn't go on to do a whole lot. This cartridge 
was the most powerful of these four and is still in use today. So I've got it kind of trailing off here because it's still being used today in Africa, as is the 375. <clears throat> it did later, if you look all the way down here, it did spawn some Weatherby cartridges. Any Weatherby based off the 378 Weatherby basically came from that 416 Rigby. But let's look at these two cartridges here, the 404 Jefferies, the 375 H&H. &H. They went on to spawn a ridiculous amount of cartridges. So let's look at that 404 Jefferies first. It actually didn't spawn a whole lot of wildcats or, you know, children to its lineage for many years. But in 1999, Remington came out with the 300 Ultra Magnum designed from that 404 Jefferies. Then later came out with a seven millimeter rum or Remington Ultra Magnum, the 338 rum and the 375 rum. In 2001, Winchester came out with a 300 Winchester short magnum, 270 Winchester short magnum and seven millimeter and 325 WSM or Winchester short magnum. Same year, Remington decided to come out with their short action ultra magnum of 307 millimeter WSM. And then in 2003, Winchester came out with their line of super short magnums in their 223 WSSM, 243 WSSM, and 25 WSSM. And then all the way to 2013, Nossler took that rum case, which once again came from the Jefferies. They came out with their Nossler line of cartridges, the first one being the 26 Nossler in 2013. The rest of these have come out from 2013 and up until now. So a lot of cartridges came from that 404 Jefferies. What about the 375 H&H &H from 1912? Well, there was also a 400 H&H, &H and and sorry, I need to stop doing that, and a 465 H&H, &H, and in 1925, they came out with a 300 H&H. &H. And then just look at some of these. You got your seven millimeter Remington Magnum in 1962. Your 264 Win Mag in 1959, your 300 Win Mag 1963, your 458 Win Mag 1956, 338 Win Mag 1958. You had your 6.5 Remington Magnum, your 350 Remington Magnum, your 8 millimeter Remington Magnum in 1978, your Shooting Times Western 1989, and then look at all these Weatherby cartridges. Starting with the 270 Weatherby in 1943, the 300, the 224, the 257, the 6.5 300, which is a fairly new one, the 7 millimeter, the 340, and the 375 Weatherby all came from that 375 H&H. &H. And all these, so once again, this is, was made for African Dangerous Game, but they were necked down and ended up producing a lot of our magnums today. So pretty much all these rounds you see would be considered magnums. And they all came from those original, really just those two African rounds that was created by the British between 1909 and 1912. Okay, let's go back up here. Got your 30 6 Springfield and your eight millimeter Mauser and your seven millimeter Mauser. I talk about them as a pair because they kind of are. Once again, the original one was an eight millimeter in 1988. Mauser kind of took that design, copied it, and then later another eight millimeter Mauser, kind of based on the combination of those two, was come out in 1985. Keep in mind, anything based on the 30-06 or the seven millimeter goes back to that original eight millimeter from eight from 19. I'm sorry, from 1888, and it has that 0.473 diameter head okay now some notable cartridges and cartridge families that we have not talked about the 250 3000 savage in 1915 this might be one you've not heard of but i bet you've heard of some of its offspring like the 22 250 so the 250 3000 savage 1915 was the first round to ever exceed 3000 feet per second it's also called the 250 Savage. That's where the 3,000 
part of the name comes from. Of course, we know in 1965, Remington necked it down to create the 22250. But also, in 1920, they necked it up to create the 300 Savage. And then you may not know this, but the 308 Winchester basically was taken from the 300 Savage. So the 30 I 6 was our um, cartridge of choice for two world wars. But in the 50s, we decided we wanted to go with something a little bit more efficient. And so we used the 300 Savage and we changed it up a bit and came out with a, three, with a 308. 1952. So the 308 came from the 300 Savage, which came from the 250 Savage. But where did it come from? Well, there's some dispute about that and some contradiction, so I can't tell you for sure, but I believe its design came from the 30 6 So in a roundabout way, I believe the 30 6 is responsible for the 308. But I can't say that for sure. But this 250 3000 Savage is a very a uh, notable cartridge, and through this lineage came out with a 308. Now we know that the th 308 has spawned the 7mm odd 8, the 260 Remington, the 243, the 338 Federal, all which are some of the greatest rounds of all time, in my opinion. Very efficient, very cool rounds. In 2007, it spawned the 30 Thompson Center. You say, well, who cares about that? Well, the 30 Thompson Center is where the 6.5 Creedmoor came from. So <clears throat> the 30 TC is not actually a direct, you know, it's it's not a necked up or neck down three weight, but it basically took its design philosophy from it. And then they necked down the 30 TC to 6.5 millimeter and, cr and created the 6.5 Creedmoor, which then was necked down to create the 6 millimeter Creedmoor. So, pretty cool little family there. What about another cool cartridge, the 284 Winchester? 284 Winchester created in 1963. Basically, it was a brand new case designed from Winchester. I don't really know where they got the idea from, but they just wanted to have a more short action version of like a 270 or a 280. Same basic, basic case capacity, but just a little bit shorter. And they created the 284, which we know has spawned a 6.5 284, 450 Bushmaster, 6.5 Weatherby RPM, and a lot more. But as far as factory, you know, produced standardized, standardized um, cartridges, it's really those three are the three big ones. This is all the way back in 1953. So some people could call that the very first short Magnum. Think about all these short action ultra magnums and winchester short magnums and winchester super short magnums some people would say the first short magnum was the 284 you might disagree and then one last really cool cartridge of note is the 375 ruger made in 19 i'm sorry in 2007. hornady and ruger had a heck of a year in 2007 and Thompson Center as well. They came out with that 30 TC, the 6.5 Creedmoor, and the 375 Ruger. And I believe also the, three seven, uh, the 300 RCM, Ruger Compact Magnum. What's the big deal about the 375 Ruger? Well, it was kind of a brand new case design, and it basically tried to, you know, come up with a more efficient modern version of the 375 H and H and you neck it down to 300 and you end up basically with your 300 PRC and then the 300 RCM was based off the 375 with a little bit of work to be done to it which you also have the 338 RCM based off of that same design that originally came from the 375 Ruger but if you take your 375 RCM and you neck it down, you have your 6.5 PRC. And then you also, from your 375, you have your 416 Ruger. So let's pan out here for a second. I know that was a ton of information, a lot of numbers and names and dates. 
But basically, starting here, smokeless powder, rimless cartridge, 0.473 diameter bullet, your eight millimeter and your seven millimeter spawned your 30 out six cartridges and your um, seven millimeter children. And then over here on the African side, those four British companies created those four calibers, specifically the 375 H and H and the 404 Jeffrey spawned all your Remington Ultra Magnums and your Short Magnums and your Nosslers and your Weatherbees and your Wind Mags and your Rim Mags. All that came from those two. And then some other notable ones, 284, 375 Ruger. And then your Creedmoors and your 308s and your Savages all came from that 250, 3000 Savage, which may in turn have also came from the 30 6 Okay, let me stop for a second here. <laughs> Okay, hopefully you're not bored or just overwhelmed with numbers, uh, a lot of numbers and words and dates, but one thing I forgot to mention, the 222 Remington had no parent case, new design, the letter on the 223 and the 556 came from that, just a little bit of reworking, and then there was a triple deuce magnum. 222 Magnum, and then later that was necked down to 204 Ruger. So that's another case that's got a pretty good lineage. But <clears throat> what do you make of this? I mean, the interesting thing to me is how few parent cartridges there really are. You know, you look at that 375 H&H, &H, 404 Jeffries, 30-06, 284, 375 Ruger, 250 Savage, and then of course your seven millimeter Mauser, those really are where everything came from. <laughs> and you've got really cool old school cartridges like your your 7.62 Russian and your 6.555 Swede. Um, you know, there's just a lot of cool cartridges. And of course, you know, the 6.5 Creedmoor and the 308 didn't directly come from the 250 Savage. They're not direct children, but they come from that lineage, so. It's pretty interesting. And then there is debate whether that lineage, the 250 Savage lineage, really comes from the 30 6 as well. I think that's the case. But without that eight millimeter label, with that smokeless powder, and without that original 1888 eight millimeter that the Germans created with the 473 heads, um, head diameter and that rimless cartridge, the first rimless cartridge, if you didn't have those two, those two pioneers, then you're not going to get to that 1891 time with the Swede, the 7 Mauser, and the 7 Russian. So, or the 762 Russian. A lot of cool stuff on there, I think. Hopefully it's interesting to you. Leave a comment below. What do you think is the most influential cartridge on here? I explained kind of the history of it. I explained what cartridges spawned what. But what do you feel is the most influential cartridge on this entire list? Be very interested to know what your feelings are on that. Anyway, I'm just going to leave it there, but until next time, take care.